I am going to start the recording. So you all should get a pop up there on your screen to consent to the recording. Um, and once you do that, uh, you were, we are good to go. So I'll hand over to you now, Chloe. Thanks. Thanks, Mark and Rob. Um, and James, I think you're starting us off now with the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this uh, presentation, I suppose. And the, the first thing I want to say is well, myself, Chloe and Sophia are just going to be talking about some of our work looking at improving levels of accessibility and inclusion on our online modules. Um, uh, but we are bringing this to you uh, in the spirit of sharing our practice as online learning practitioners, uh, not as experts, as people who encountered st stuff that we, did, we hadn't encountered in that specific way in the last year, uh, and in response to that have been doing work, and that's what we want to share. Um, do you want to go on to the next slide? Um, so to, to put this in context, uh, we all work on fully online uh, open education uh, programs in DCU. Um, so open education, meaning anyone over the age of 23 automatically can, you know, gets a place, can study. So very open uh, but, and fully online. Uh, up until this year, I think we would have rated ourselves on any kind of checklist or, you know, as doing pretty well in terms of universal design for learning and levels of accessibility. We had, like, let's say we have our own online learning design guide that we have that we we have for ourselves and for new people who are engaged, you know, working with us or for us in terms of making online learning materials. Um, and in that, we already had sort of guidelines on UDL in that context. Um, when accessibility checkers were run on our Moodle based courses, they, they, they did well, you know, there weren't many identifiable issues uh, in there. And we had kind of established practice or established expertise in terms of supporting students registered with DCU's Disability and Learning Support Service in terms of providing exam accommodations, assessment accommodations working contacting them proactively at the start of the year working with them you know if if they were reporting that their registered conditions or impairments were impacting on them at any time um and so we we thought we were doing pretty well but some stuff then came up this year that caused us to reflect but i'll, I'll leave that for a second so i'm going to hand over to chloe now who's gonna um just give a very quick a very quick look at what one of our courses looks like just for context Thanks, James. Um, so this is uh, how we have set up the majority of our modules um, online. So this is PY100, which is the kind of introduction to psychology module that myself and uh, my colleague Patrice uh, tutor on. So how we've set this up is at the top of each page, there is um, some general information and pages that uh, might be useful for students in terms of um, plagiarism and referencing styles. And then obviously it's a place where they can access the online classroom as well. Then there's a module overview and inside the module handbook, we have links to various supports that are available for, for our students. Um, which is also inclusive to any supports that might be of interest to those with any specific um, conditions or impairments. Then we have a specific place uh, for our tutorial resources. So um, our online classes uh, are, are tutorials and in each tutorial, we have a set of slides and maybe some uh, extra activities or exercises. And these are all uh, placed in the one place here uh, so that students can access them easily and, and find them easily and locate them easily as well. Then the module is broken down into various parts. The first part here um, is about introduction and developmental psychology. And each part, there is a discussion forum where students can ask questions or the tutors come in and then uh, provide information on the tutorials or maybe different resources that we, we, we believe to be helpful for the students. And then there are learning books. So all the learning materials are uh, within the, the, these books and then the corresponding quizzes and the corresponding assignment to do with that part of the module as well. So this is how each part is set up. That's part one. Part two is the exact same. We have the discussion forum, the learning materials and the assignment and so on. Yeah, I can go back to the slides. 
and hand over to Sophia. So um, thank you Chloe, for that overview. Um, so one thing that, so we, we have a very well established uh, way of, of uh, presenting our modules and uh, of doing things. And as, um, as James was, was saying, up until this year, we thought we were doing pretty well uh, in terms of uh, how we were um, supporting uh, our students. Um, but a number of things happened uh, this academic year, 21, 22, that got us to really stop and think about our practices and um, question some of them and review a few of the things we were doing. So the first thing um, was that uh, within, we had a larger number of students enrolling in, uh, our, in our programs. Um, so with this increased number of students, um, th this also meant that we had um, an increasing number of students that were registering, that have registered with, um, for disabilities and conditions uh, with the, the LSS. Um, and then also, of course, we need to take into account those students that may, may have conditions, um, you know, or, or disabilities, and that prefer not to register um, with the DLSS. So we were encouraged then by the head of the DLSS to, um, to have um, attend specific trainings for, uh, to help us um, deal with issues that may arise in terms of in the context of our programs, um, in terms of how to best support uh, and teach students on the autism spectrum. Um, we also realized that there was, uh, although we thought again, that we, were, we, we thought we were doing well, but we realized there was also a gap in terms of the, of the information that was actually available um, to our part-time academic staff. So um, in terms of students that were registered with the DLSS, uh, that information was available to coordinators and chairs, module coordinators and chairs, but not so much to, to our, our tutors. Um, and this obviously creates an issue there because tutors need to know uh, as they're dealing with the students um, on a regular basis. Um, we also had then some, uh, some students getting in touch with us and really highlighting uh, some of the things that were not working for them. Um, in particular, we had one student who uses assistive uh, technology to, um, to, to really access any kind of content, including uh, Moodle. Um, and we, we then realized, for example, that some, uh, some, of, this, some of, the, of the information on our, um, on our pages was not readable, was not accessible through that uh, technology. Um, we also then realized that um, our, uh, we, we did not realize that Zoom had um, made the feature of closed caption available since uh, June or May, June, 2021. So then once we realized that we were able to turn it on, but again, we, we had a prompt from one, one of our students. Um, and another aspect that um, was raised to us, uh, and again, this was uh, for the first time, was that uh, students, particularly students uh, on the autism spectrum, found um, the use of forums uh, on our um, model pages extremely overwhelming. So for them, uh, and this is uh, the forums on, on our Moodle pages uh, are really the most, uh, the most common way for students and academic staff to communicate and for academic staff to inf share information. Uh, and we realized then that for some of the students, this kind of communication was really not working. Um, and, and by the way, some, some of our academic staff also highlighted that this information was uh, a bit overwhelming for other students as well, not just those on the autism spectrum. Um, 
And for some, finally, for one last point that is related again to students on the autism spectrum is that uh, the, there was not enough structure uh, in the module for, uh, for them. So this is something that we've been taking into account in terms of uh, feedback and really trying to, to address um, as a point going forward. So I'll give the microphone back to Chloe. So yeah, as a way to kind of utilize this feedback and action it, um, what we did is we created a, a book within our version of Moodle Loop. And uh, in this book, we provided lots of resources for our teaching staff around UDL. Uh, so here's a quick kind of snapshot of the table of uh, contents here. Um, the introduction, uh, there's some videos from the AHEAD website here around UDL as kind of an introduction to UDL. Uh, for new staff joining us as well. Some information on the inclusive teaching practices. So a lot of stuff that Sophia mentioned there, we had students who use assistive technology and just for our tutors to be aware of that. Um, and uh, we've included some links there on how to improve uh, documents to be more accessible for those using uh, assistive technology. And also just to uh, create um, accessible documents overall. So that relates to how to create Word documents, uh, PowerPoint slides uh, in a way that is accessible. Then the fourth section there is about developing accessibility in Loop. Um, again, our version of Moodle, which would then uh, contain a lot of information around the use of alt text for images and the inclusion of subtitles or uh, captions in the videos that might be uploaded to uh, the learning materials as well. Sophia also mentioned that we got a bit of feedback around Zoom. So we made guidelines for our staff and for our students on how to set up their Zoom accounts so that they can include the live transcripts um, in their meetings as well. And then the last point there is just around supporting our students on the autism spectrum. Again, given that we did have such a, a high rate of students registered this year who identified as, as being on the spectrum. And this was a training then that we were provided with from our occupational therapist in DCU to talk about best ways to improve our teaching practices for those with ASC. And then all of these materials from this session were also included on that loop book that was shared with the, the staff as well. So I think that's, I think that's back to me for uh, in one minute, I'll tell you what's going on then. So that all happened up to about some point in November. Um, and then we we were starting to look at, okay, what other, from what we've been told from this feedback we've gotten, what other specific design tweaks could we make within the Moodle courses in order to improve accessibility and inclusion? Now that we've kind of stepped back, reflected, gathered some best practice, put that together, put it out to the whole, uh, you know, our whole team. Um, but at a point it was kind of like, hang on, we are learning too much. We are doing too much here to just continue on with this just in the day to day. So we stopped, we initially wrote it up as a structured evidence-based reflection. Then we turned it into a research, a research study proposal. We got ethics from the university to do that. We got a small amount of research funding to support that from the quality, the quality office in, in DCU. And that is what we are doing now. We are now collecting data from the student body in general, we did a focus group with just a student group that had uh, students not registered with the Disability Learning Support Service and students who were registered with that service. Um, uh, we're gathering uh, one to, like individual feedback from students with specific conditions or impairments, whether they're registered or not, um, to get their to get their take on certain tweaks that we're thinking about making. We're also doing that with staff in a focus group this week. Uh, and we've been doing interviews with some critical friends, as we call them, people from the Teaching Enhancement Unit, from the Disability Learning Support Service, to get their, and others, to get their take on what, you know, 
do they see any pros, cons? Do they have other suggestions about things we might do or how we might do them? So we're looking at our discussion forums and we are looking at the range of things that the discussion forums currently do. And we're looking at how can we take the heat out of the discussion forum for those that find it overwhelming. So there might be some fundamental stuff about the size of modules and how many students are in it and that kind of thing. And we can look at that. But at the moment, we're looking at taking kind of announcement type posts and maybe moving those to the announcements or we call course notice board. Uh, so that, you know, those are separate from discussion, actual discussion posts. And we're looking at maybe uh, uh, not posting files or not only posting files in there. So you're going in and you're trying to find the right thread to, to find a post or to find a, an attachment or something like that. So we're looking at taking the heat out of those. We're looking at the structure of our Moodle pages. We're looking at how we might indicate to students, especially in first year, what the flow of the module is, how long it how long it should take to work through different parts of the course we don't currently quite have that in our in in the the way the structure of the course so we're looking at solutions either in inside the learning, online learning materials or how we what else we might present to the students in the course to say right if you're at this point you're doing okay you're kind of running with the flow of the module um, and we're looking at where within the modules or within other information we give the students how can we normalize and make more explicit our approach to accessibility and inclusion, you know, just in general. So that, that's some of the stuff we're thinking we're doing now. And we're basically, we want to get st stakeholder feedback and then make some of these tweaks, especially the ones that can be made in the short term, and then kind of do design cycle, uh, sort of iterative feedback uh, from the stakeholders again. So if we actually make some changes to how we operate the discussion forums, then ask people, is that working? Or did we just make a new barrier? Did we just move the barrier somewhere else? Um, and see what they say. So that that's what's going on. Sorry, we're three, four, four minutes after. <laughs> Maybe we should have stopped. Um, we still have a little bit of time for discussion and Q and A. That's wonderful, James, Chloe, and Sophia. Thank you so much. Uh, so over to you, Andrew. Great, thank you, um, and good afternoon. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey this afternoon. We're going to be talking about H5P, which is a plugin which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but if you're not, you will be in 15 minutes. And I've been told to keep very much to time by Rob, so let's see how it goes. Um, I'm Andrew Field. I'm e-learning manager at Cambridge International, which is part of uh, Cambridge University, and we are the world's largest provider of international education programmes and qualifications for five to 19-year-olds. Now, that was the part I had to say. What I'd like to do now is take you slightly back in history. Um, I was a history teacher originally in the last century. I discovered Moodle and loved the accessibility of Moodle, the ability for me to put resources online and make use of them. This screen you're currently looking at is one that I put together for 14 year olds to do a bit of programming in their computing work. Um, and what I always try to do with Moodle is actually hide a lot of the Moodle elements. So we're looking here at a 2004 item, and you'll, sh you'll soon see why I've started with this. Now, what we're talking here is a little bit of programming, a bit of computer code, which is never, ever ideal to present on a Moodle course. You've got text upon text upon text, which is not going to be very good. What I then used to do was use Adobe Flash. I would stay up for ages programming little games, mini quizzes, mini interactive items that would grab the learner's attention. So this, I remember, was a bit of code where we explained what arrays were, how the structure could work, what you could do. And then immediately they had a little quiz to check their understanding. This is no formal assessment. This was a quick item. And as you can see here, you've got lots of colours, lots of bright in your face items. But all of the interactive items, all of the interest here, no longer exists. So what we had was the demise of Flash, and quite right that Flash did disappear because it's not mobile friendly, it wasn't accessible unless you did an enormous amount of work to provide the additional items that went along with it, is we had a, a, a real limitation in what we could actually provide. And that's when I first came across H5P. Now, they summarise on their website far better than I can, and in quite shouty capital letters, actually, which I quite like. Um, this is a way of embedding content within your actual Moodle courses. And I'm sure many of you are extremely familiar with this. But I just want to go through the journey at Cambridge International of how we use this. So 
I shared this with our curriculum support team. I'm part of a, a division in, in my organization called Teaching and Learning. We have fantastic opportunities to explore uses of technology, great uses of Moodle, how we can um, allow learners to make better use of technology and support teachers to, to make really empowered use of technology, which is where they're using it to make a difference. The key thing we always talk about this is it's clearly it's about the learning, not the technology. So the moment something like H5P comes along, you think, oh, wow, how could I use that in my materials? Which, of course, is the wrong way around. We need to be familiar with H5P and their examples page is a fantastic one, a sort of brilliant list of all these offers and interactive items that they offer. But just like Moodle, none of these ever quite work for the exact need that you have for your Moodle course. They nearly do. They're nearly absolutely perfect. It's not quite what you want. But H5P for us was a way of showing to colleagues, if you want to create interactive content, consider this, but make sure there's value. So um, this is a kind of thing that we were presenting by Moodle about four years ago. So this is an interactive resource to support um, uh, IGCC literature in English. And what we did was actually hide a lot of the Moodle elements and tried to make, here's the assessment objective, here's the document you can use to access this, here's the embedded video to use this, and here's your transcript if you need it. So these were um, resources we could offer. Now, what I did with all of these was actually um, put resources at the bottom of the Moodle course use labels and we present materials in this way. Um, English, of course, was quite straightforward because we're talking about prose, we're talking about text, we're about presenting items. Um, the challenge then comes when we talk about science. That's not just because I'm originally a history teacher, um, I'm talking generally in terms of presenting science materials, there's always an issue. So for this, we used H5P. And what we have here is a very simple looking course, but we've got these are key core experiments that our learners um, aged 10 to uh, sorry, uh, aged 14 to 16 needed to look at. And what my colleagues wanted was a way of presenting video materials to them, but also providing a teacher walkthrough of that video, then providing a virtual experiment, which is where the learner could work through it themselves and it would pause and ask some questions, then provide support materials then provide additional transcripts if that was needed, and then provide a quiz. Now, this is where we used H5P. The best uses of H5P is where nobody knows you're even using it. So as I'm presenting this to you here, we've got the video. If you choose the teacher walkthrough, here's an H5P item. And as I play this, um, maybe I'll just pull one of the items here. We've got the actual video, but then it pauses with some items, some suggestions. So just like effective use of technology here, we're not saying, oh, go on to your H5P item. Instead, we're going, here's the teacher walkthrough, or if a learner wants to use the virtual experiment themselves, this is another H5P element, where again, it's got little questions, pause, and sort of ask what you think about it. Now, what I actually want to do here is just spend a little moment just to look at it. So forgive me, people who sort of um, run away in horror when we look at a bit of HTML. This is nothing to be scared about at all. This is just a Moodle label. It's all we're looking at here. But all we've done here is make use of um, a little bit of CSS, a little bit of uh, H5P, and literally here, we've got the items with links to them, and then embed in the live frame that's then delivered through this section here. So without going into huge detail, if you want any detail of that, I'm delighted to go into all of that at any stage, but I realise that might be sort of a bit boring for, for colleagues if they're not into that. But all we've really got here is actually items down the bottom of the screen here, which when you're accessing this as a learner, or and so I'll go on to a little bit um, as a guest access to this, you don't see these at all. But these are the actual H5P items that we've got. These are the items here that um, when we turn editing on with this, I'm sure this turned off. When we turn editing on with this, this is what my colleagues use to build these items. And H5P is an incredibly useful resource because you can choose what interactive type you want from those examples that we've just seen. And then because we've then, uh, you've then got all your materials which have been uploaded, you've added all the other items, and it's actually really straightforward. So it comes down again to how best to use these materials. So 
The next part of the story I want to go on to is we, we developed to these. These became a subscription resource for Cambridge International Schools to get access to and a whole range of materials. We were really pleased with them. Um, the key thing, though, was the issue that happened to all of us um, end of February, March 2020. What we did here was we opened up resources. We turned any subscription off. We opened it up for everyone to access it at all. Usually, we were getting around um, 50,000 accesses a month, 50,000 hits, if those of you know about these liberal statistics. Um, the moment we turned the access to open access, the guest access, it shot up to um, 1.3 million accesses it, immediately. Now, the great thing about H5P, the absolutely brilliant thing about it, is that it scaled with us. We didn't get one, one second of downtime. So a brilliant tool that you can pick how you want to use it, but really, really importantly, it's, it's vital you use it for your learning needs, not because it feels like funky technology. So really pleased with that. Um, as an example, sort of how we use Moodle as well, um, we had an urgent need to communicate exams information for obvious reasons. Um, we had lots of PDFs where these were presented, but actually a PDF, whilst someone might be delighted to look through these, that's not good enough for many people. So what we did was use these resources, use these suggestions as a way of presenting these items in as, as an accessible and interesting way as possible. Now, this is where you might have thought, oh, H5P is the ideal answer for this. It wasn't for this instance, but what we decided to do with this is there was a great interest in a further resource, which is this one, which is an, an item called Kitchen Science. This is where learners can complete their, um, their, their materials, complete their experiments for their um, requirements for their syllabus in their own kitchen at home. Now, we're talking here, hopefully, safe and um, carefully conducted experiments. But this is where colleagues wanted to turn an interactive presentation based on H5P into a useful resource. Now, what we have here is an example is where a colleague has got overexcited about H5P. This actually isn't a great use of it. And for the actual resource that we've developed, and we'll happily share these sort of afterwards if we need to, we haven't used H5P. So what it's really important to do here is use H5P where you can clearly identify impact. What we found here was actually these items, all based on a single H5P, um, became too complicated. This doesn't react well to uh, different browser sizes, different devices. But simple, accessible items are really, really good with H5P. The absolute best way I've found we can use these is where you create the item yourself and then you hide it. I'm, obviously, I'm sure many colleagues are very familiar with this, but the H5P resource at the bottom, that resource is then hidden, but then made accessible. And then you can embed it directly into your Moodle course. And so I'll be delighted to share sort of how that could be done. Um, and what it allows us to do then is to make use of H5P at the exact time that we want to. Um, and so fast forward to where we are right now, this is something I've been working on this week, which again is a Moodle course, but if you're not a Moodle person, you wouldn't know this is a Moodle course. So what we've done here is like a, a little menu page. We've got a whole load of resources for these different attributes for this course that we're looking at. If you click on one of these items, you want to look at collaboration, you can see these ones. If you want to filter it by, uh, sort it by group or pair activities, or actually a bit silly to use collaboration there because it would involve groups. You know. um, let's maybe look at coping. You can see a whole range of different activities. Or here, you can sort of type it and be able to find it. Now, this is where we've taken Moodle courses and tried to actually de Moodle them. Now, I absolutely love Moodle. It's a fantastic resource for me. One of my colleagues can tell me we need an urgent resource available to the world within 12 hours and we can do it. But a lot of this is about how you set these things up behind the scenes, how we present these materials. And that's really where I wanted to leave you. Um, H5P is a fantastic tool to use. Just don't rush to use it. Make sure you can identify the clear impact of using one of these items because they are incredibly powerful.